right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our second Our Ladies chat in, in two weeks. Uh, we're making up for, for the slow start of the year. Um, today we have Mayel Salmon, who's talking to us. Uh, really very excited about this. Uh, she's going to give us an overview of, um, well, teach us how to build an R package. But I want to just tell you a little bit about her first. So if you Google her, she's quite easy to find. Um, and she is currently, um, sorry, I'm trying to read messages at the same time. She's a part-time research software engineer for Open for R Open Sci since February 2018. She's done various R development, well, is busy with ver various R development and training contracts such as R Hub Blog, HTTP testing in R book. Um, she's on the peer review system for R packages. So this is the lady you need to speak to. Um, and also the main manager of the R Ladies Global Twitter account. So definitely uh, the, the one you want to speak to. And I want to just share my screen quickly to your CV. Sorry, it, it was so nice and, uh, and impressive. I wanted to share it and then I will switch it off. So if you uh, look at her bio, uh, I'm sure we have a few PhD students here in the, in the crowd. There's such a cute little graphic here about how long it took her to do her PhD. And I really thought it was nice. Wait for it, wait for it. It was very cathartic to create. <laughs> <laughs> the station so time of day. So I thought it was lovely. So yeah, you have an incredibly talented, uh, inspirational person in front of you. And it also took her a long time to do her PhD, as it should be. So please don't stress. <laughs> it is fine. <laughs> um, so you can... I'll I'll put this uh, link into the chat Nana as well if you want to go and work that you if you Google it you can find it very easily. So thank you, Mal. We are really 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 excited to have you today here today, and we really uh, appreciate your time. And uh, you'll you'll give us instructions as to what we should do and not do. And yes, as she said earlier, please interact as you go. Um, yeah, and if you want to turn your cameras on. Please leave them on. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah, and, and and interrupt me with questions if you want. There are not so many of us, but like it'd be helpful <laughs> to have the interruptions not um, uh, disruptive. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. So portion of screen share. I know you should see my whole screen. <laughs> um, so uh, let me start with the slides. Oops. Sorry. So I'm joining from Nancy, and I'm very happy the second time I speak at Are You Joining Network, and I'm, I'm really happy to, to return. Uh, so I, I really like our package development. So, and I don't have a gift <laughs> to show that contrary to the one on my, on my CV. So, as uh, Inger said, I'm a volunteer editor for our open science software peer review and at work for our open science, where I work part time. I maintain our dev guide, which is a guide about software peer review but we've also uh, our guidance on how to develop our packages. I created the Har Hub blog, where you can find many posts on different topics, some of them very niche, some of them less niche uh, of our package development. And um, last year, no, or was it the year before that, <laughs> recently, during the pandemic, I worked on the HTTP testing in our uh, book for those of you who have packages or want to run packages that interact with web resources. And uh, I actually don't maintain many packages. I contribute to packages. So recently I've contributed to package done and I will show package on briefly today. It's a package to produce documentation website for packages. Uh, so it's a bit meta than Fledge. So Fledge uh, is a package for smoother change tracking. So when you make a change in your package, it's better if you put it in a file called news.md but with Fledge, these things uh, happen more or less um, automatically. And I also contributed to Glitter. Glitter is a package to uh, more easily write Sparkle queries. So Sparkle is the language you use, for instance, to interact with Wikidata. So um, why would one uh, develop an R package? Uh, so I hope you already think it's a good idea because you came here today. I'm going to admit this person. Yeah. <laughs> um, so developing an R package is the easiest way you have to share code, data, or R magnet templates with you, you like tomorrow or you in a few months with the, your collaborators, or your colleagues, and also collaborators you don't know. So if you have an R package, you make it public, it could be useful to anyone. 
in, in, the, in the world. <laughs> um, and why would you learn about packet development? So John Calder um, has very good wording for that because you don't uh, necessarily learn about packet development to develop packages, although that's a, a thing. So the first reason to learn packet development is to share code uh, and data, but also to leverage existing tooling, maybe for other projects and to contribute to other packages. So it's really empowering to know how to develop a, a package or, or to have the basics of uh, what a package is. And then who can write um, a package, so you. So Susan Johnston had very uh, wise words in a presentation. I, I don't remember, maybe it was an Alitis made up, I can't remember. So in any, any case, um, the questions are, can you open R or R Studio? So hopefully yes. Can you install a package? Hopefully yes to. Have you ever written a function in R? So hopefully yes, but if you haven't, could you learn how to write a function in R? And if the answer is yes here, and I'm um, convinced that anyone can learn how to write a function in R, then you can write a package in R. That's not that difficult. If you need to learn about functions, I've listed um, a few uh, resources that I find useful for this topic. But today we, we won't, uh, well, we will have one function or two, but that won't be the topic. So what is a package? Um, I really like this quote by Sébastien Rochette, who said, to be less afraid, you have to tell yourself that it's simply a folder organized in a constrained way. So an R package is a folder of files with a searcher that uh, follows a standard. Now, what could be um, a bit frightening here is how do we remember the structure? How do we follow it? And that's where automation comes into play. So you can automate the creation of these folders and files. And maybe if you used Excel like a long time ago, you remember Clippy. Uh, and if you don't, well, <laughs> too bad for you because it was a, a fun uh, little helper. And uh, but there is uh, something as useful or more useful actually than Clippy was called the use this package that will help you automate the creation of a package. So use this is a package that's uh, now a uh, few years old. In 2017, Jenny Bryan, who is one of the maintainers of the use this package together with Hadley Wickham, tweeted, use this package, implement this important principle, automate that which can be automated. Your computer was literally born to implement root but fussy stuff for you. And that's really the principle that underlies use this and why we use this is such a, a useful package. So today, I have three goals. I hope that you will get to know the, um, the best tools for package development, or at least the one that I think has the best uh, these days. I also want to share that there is no magic, only practice and tips, and where to find the best information or where to how to um, improve. And then um, also think, um, I hope you can think of whether you want to contribute to open source packages and in, uh, uh, under which uh, conditions. So there is a material website for today, and it has a different category. So in intro, uh, where we have the steps of the demonstration back right here, I will be copy pasting code from a page called snippets. So that's where the code, uh, the code snippets live. And you can find links to the GitHub repository as well as to the um, uh, further resources that we won't have covered uh, today. Why can't I, I can't see, okay. Uh, and I will start with a demonstration and where we were going to build a small package, but with uh, different uh, aspects. So yeah, and the first thing I wanted to show was, uh, do you know where your packages are, the so installed packages? Does anyone know where they are on your computer? Are you able to locate the folder where that is? Like, uh, so the way to find that out is this function, libpath. So for instance, most of them are in the first uh, path that libpath uh, returns. So if I go if I go back, I can see the folders with all the installed um, packages. So that might be interesting uh, if you're ever curious. Well, I remember when I used Windows, I'm now in Ubuntu, sometimes I had to go and delete stuff there because sometimes things would get stuck. But no, nowadays, I, I don't go in that folder uh, very, very often. So there, so then to develop a package, there is um, 
a, a given amount of setup uh, to do and uh, a few packages to install. And the first one, that one we need to, in, is my, uh, is the font size big enough? Yeah? Yeah, if anyone, okay. I find yeah. it okay. Okay, good. And if anyone disagrees, then please um, uh, interrupt me. So the first package will be the DevTools package. That we, we had. so I've already installed it, which is why I'm not running the uh, not running the comments. So that's one to install. Then another package is a package available. So it's less necessary, but it's it's cool. It's to find out whether a package name is available. And so that's uh, two packages to to install. Then uh, and another resource to know how to install packages is so wait. Um, why can't I click here? Sorry, I'm trying to regain control of my own website. No. Okay, so there is um, a setup chapter in the R packages book, and it's really, really good, really thorough. So that's something I would recommend following when one. Uh, and uh, needs to, oh, and it actually has more packages, but what I it's, it, it, um, said we would need. So let's see. Um, and so once one has followed all the, the setup steps, which are boring, but uh, thankfully we only need to do that once per computer. And another good news is that the more times we do that, the easier it becomes with time. So for the next computer, we have functions to check that things are okay. So DevTools has a function called asdevel that we can run and it should answer something like, the system is ready to build packages. And if it doesn't, it should have an informative uh, answer on why, um, why you, you can't build packages yet, what is missing. DevTools also has a function called devctrep. Um, and CTRIP means situational report, and it should tell, uh, tell us a few things about uh, the state of package building. Okay, so there is one problem <laughs> today with it. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe it will work for you. I think I have a, um, uh, maybe a weird version of our studio installed, so it didn't work, but <laughs> hopefully it will work for you, and normally it does, um, it does work then. So I know I can build packages because I've built packages, but I can also use a function um, in USB, sorry. So another important aspect of developing packages that we won't really, uh, well, we will see today, but not really um, uh, explain is, is version control with Git and use this as both uh, very useful tools for using Git, but also tools for checking your Git installation, as well as documentation on USB's website. So there is another CTRIP function, the situational report function for Git in USBs. And it checks many, many things. And I, I, I ran it last week and there was still a thing that I had forgotten to do. So I hadn't vaccinated my Git configuration, which I did. And what's important is that when something is not uh, good or optimal yet, use this will give you a very informative way on how to fix things. So that's really um, a precious tool to use when you use Git and also GitHub uh, for our package development. So that's, uh, these are these few function. Now, one, one thing that might be useful when developing packages is saving preferences somewhere. And this somewhere is our profile. So I'm going to type use this edit R profile. So that this one, the R profile is an R file that is run every time you restart R. So the code that is there is always run when you, when you restart R. So this is my uh, R profile. So these options, uh, we don't need to go into it today. It's for um, as a, um, I can find any, any, any work that the backtrace when there is an error. But what I really wanted to show is the use these options I have in here. And these options are described in the use this setup article that you can find on use this website. And they say that when I use Git, I prefer to use an SSH protocol. There is my name. 
And there is also my name, but expressed in a way that it could go in a package, uh, in package metadata. So name, um, last name, and also my email address, my OCID ID, my proof of license. And when I start a new package, I want the version number to be this. And it could be anything. So that's where you save your preferences. So then every time you write a new, uh, you start a new package, this is where the value comes from. So you don't need to write your name a thousand times. And in my R profile, every time I start R, these lines mean I'm uh, loading WebRex, DevTools, GET, which is a package to use Git, and Lookup. Lookup is a package to look at the source of R functions. But what's very um, specific to today is the idea that every time I, I start R, I have DevTools loaded and also use, use this because uh, DevTools loads just this, if I'm not mistaken. Wait, I have a big doubt right now. Yeah, <laughs> use this is also uh, loaded every time I set up R. So this was a lot of uh, setup and intro. So now I'm going to create a package um, that I want to call mini package because I'm not inspired to name it. So it's uh, it will be a toy package, so it does need a very cool name. Uh, and the first steps uh, when choosing a new package name is to ensure, like if it were, if it's a package just for you, it doesn't matter if it's a name that's not original because uh, there won't be any conflict. But now if it's a package that it, that's intended for wider distribution, you don't want to call it deployer, for instance, because there is already a, a deployer package. So to check that, to check there is no package on CRAN, no package on Bioconductor um, that share this name, you can use available package, uh, but as an available uh, function. And I can type the name, uh, the target name of my package, mini package, and see what it returns to me. And now it's querying the different repositories to see whether the name is available. Uh, so what it does as well, and this is very useful, in particular for us non-native speakers, it's going to query urban dictionary because some words can have very offensive meanings in, in other, another language, which we might not be um, in English, which we might not be aware of. I'm going to say no here just to save the queries, but because mini package is just not a, a word, but it, it's very useful to check that. So I'm say no. Um, and so it's opening Wikipedia in case I wanted to see what the name meant. Uh, on Wikipedia, I guess, Wikidata, uh, abbreviations, just so it, it really helps you find uh, like whether the name you are using is available, but also not meaning something you don't want it to uh, mean. You don't want your package to be associated with. So it's available on CRAN and Bearconnector is not available on GitHub, which is not uh, really um, a bad in this case because I don't want to, to publish it. So that's uh, good to know. And once I've done that, I can create uh, the package. And to create the package, I um, can use, use this create package function. So just a note that I'm uh, in this demonstration, I'm always typing use this dot, 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 um, twice. All the use this is already loaded. So I could just type create package and it would work but I wanted to be clear that it's a function that comes from USBase today. But if you bloodied USBase via your R profile, you don't need to write USBase every time, so which, which uh, might get repetitive. So use this, create um, package, and I'm going to create it one level up from the folder in which I'm currently. And I'm, uh, the path uh, indicates the name of the of, of the package. So let's do that. So it did a lot of things, and then it opened the new uh, project. But so I now have two R Studio session open. One is a new package, and another R Studio uh, session is the one I was in, and I want to go back to here because that was quick. So I type use this create package. And then it did all this thing. And it's really great to see because there is a lot of things here that I didn't have to do myself. So everything here is time saved and work saved. So it created a folder called many package. 
it set the active project to that um, uh, folder. It created an R folder there and then a description file. The description file contains important metadata about the package and it filled it with my name. So how did it guess my, my name? This came from the R profile I've shown previously. There are still things I will need to fill up, for instance, what the package does. It chose my preferred description. Um, so this is the uh, description. Then it created a namespace file that we will see later. It created an R profile, which is important for RStudio. It added to R build ignore. I, I will uh, explain it later. So it did all these things, and then it opened the new uh, folder in a new RStudio session. And that's where I'm going to go now. And in general, use this when it does something. Uh, there are messages. So you see what, what's, what's happening and what you didn't have to do yourself. So this is my new package. And in that package, I have, a, I have several files, so hidden files. So git ignore here is a list of files that won't be tracked by version control. But, so that means when I later, when we put this uh, folder on GitHub, this, which contain um, different preferences, won't be uh, in there. And it's very important sometimes when we have a very big folder that we don't want or like secret uh, stuff. Then uh, I'll build ignore. Here is these things that won't go to the built version of your package that you would send to CRAN, for instance. So we don't uh, need the R Studio stuff to be in this built version of the package. So to come uh, to more, uh, more and more important file, here we have the description file with the metadata about the package. So what the package does. So it's one line it's supposed to be title. Okay, so I'm going to set example stuff. Uh, and then I could fill here the description too. I'm not going to do that, but in general you should because otherwise uh, there are different stuff that's created for your package uh, will be less informative. If this sentence appears, what the package does, it's not helpful at all. Then there is our upward file, which is uh, the RStudio, uh, which are the RStudio options. The namespace is empty at the moment. So we will see that when we create a function, but that's where the functions we'll create uh, will be listed. But we, as it says, do not edit by hand. We will not need to uh, edit this file by hand. Uh, but in the past, a long time ago, before DevTools and Workstation 2, you would have to, you would have had to uh, do that. And there is a R folder. So R folder is empty for now. That's where our code, our functions will live. So that's where we are now. After running only one, use this function. So um, just to ensure that I'm tracking things correctly, I'm going to track this um, package with Git. So I think I said other version control is um, not a topic we're going to uh, learn today. And it's not, so you can learn how to, to create a package without knowing version control, but it's, it's a useful, once you know how to build a package, if you don't know version control yet, that's really a nice uh, skill to add to your tool set. So, so, but if you don't uh, know Git today, don't uh, don't worry. So I'm using the uh, use this function called use Git to create a Git repository for my folder. And as usual, it said it said many things. So it initializes a Git repository, and it asks me whether it's fine to commit this file, which means um, track uh, track them. And I'm going to say yeah. And I need to restart our studio, and I'm okay with that. So I'm typing three for definitely. Is there any question? Uh, I think Jawad just asked a question. Can you repeat this? I'm not. I think he's. It just came in, so I think he's referring to the. Um, no, it's referring. I think. So what you can maybe just type again, but referring to the Thomas's question above about um, using dev tools to start the R package. Oops. Ah, oh, he says it's okay. We'll watch the recording. Okay, but yeah. okay. 
And all the questions were answered in the chat then. Yes, yeah, so so okay. Andre asked, answered Thomas's question. So you've got some okay. helpers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so at this stage, we only have a skeleton of the, of the package, so these different uh, files, but there is no code in there. So we're going to, to add a function in a file called time. So I'm going to take the code from my snippets if I can find them again, yes. So um, to move that, I'm clicking on the button here to get this code on my clipboard. So that, that won't appear magically, that's where it comes from. So the, from the snippets page of the uh, website. So to uh, the R code, well, even the R folder in R files, and to create a new uh, one of this, we can use uh, use this function called use this use R, and we give it a name. I can't remember what the name of the functions was. <laughs> Sorry, what time? Okay, so let's, I'm going to call it what time, like the function I will create in there. So that's all I need to type, and what it's uh, doing is creating. Um, a new R script under the R folder. And it saves uh, one quite a few clicks to uh, have that happen this way. And in here, I'm going to paste code that I add on my clipboard and save. And this is a function, a very boring function that will return the time uh, it is now, like a, 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 it will return a character string with, the, with a sentence that indicates uh, the time. So how do I uh, get this function in my session? Because right now, if I type uh, what time, very cool, it's uh, imp oh, I'm sorry, I should have changed the language here. So it says it's impossible to find this function. So uh, what one way, one thing we might think of before we get used to the packaging workflow, we would source the file, but that's not what we're going to do. We're going to use uh, um, dev tools load all. So it's dev tool function, load all and what it does is it loads uh, in particular all the r files that are under the r folder so i'm doing that and if i type what time now it gives me uh, uh so it works and it gives me the time it is um it is now so we have a, a function and uh, i forgot to show it it was here in the r folder what time dot r so we write the code in the as functions in the, in the R script in the R folder, and we load them into the R session, uh, session with the function called load all of the package dev tools. So that's good, but our function is not documented. And, and also it's not exported, meaning that if someone were to install this package, they wouldn't get the what time function. So I'm going to show you how we register and document the function. So to do that, we are going to add what's called a Roxygen 2 skeleton. So we go under, all right, yeah, under code uh, in R Studio, and then there is uh, this insert Roxygen skeleton with, and there is also a Hebrew shortcut that one could learn here. So I'm going to click here, and it's adding a lot of lines. So there are code comments starting with this sign, but we also with the quote sign. So these are the lines that our student tool uh, will use to document our package. And it's, to, uh, it's something we should feel. So we should replace the title with uh, something like indicate time. It has, uh, and these things starting with an at are the oxygen two tags. And the one that have been added here are the most important ones but there are other uh, tags and we will see at least another one uh, today. So return is where we explain what our function returns. So it's a character um, and a string. Uh, and it's export, it means that this function will be a public facing function of our package. When you write an R package, you can have a ton of functions, some of them that are only used by your own package. And this one should not be exported, so the users shouldn't be able to see them um, in the help pages. They should be able to, to use them. So, but this function is a public facing function, so we want it to be exported. And then there is a tag example. So, under it, we can write an example. 
this function is so simple that it makes uh, it might make this a uh, little sense, but we're still going to do that. So this is the example. So until now, all this documentation only lives uh, in the package uh, in the in this file itself. So the comment to remember to transform that is a document um, comment from DevTools. So it's a uh, document. And like use this, this tells us what happens. So it's writing namespace. So let's go and see what is in namespace. Now in the namespace file, we see that we have export what time. And it's very important because it means that when users later load our package, they will have this um, function available. Because the way uh, we do that when developing the package using the load all of, um, function, that's not how the users will use our package. The users will install the package, write library, mini package, and then they can use the what time function. So that's uh, very good that it listed here. And it also wrote the .rd file. So we have a new folder here called man, like manual. And in there, we now have a um, file, what time.rd. So let's open it. So, and uh, we have here, this document is read, read only. And here it's also written, generated by Worksygen 2, do not edit by hand. That's very good. So uh, before there was Worksygen 2, this package, uh, this file is something package developers would have to write by hand. All this stuff that looks a lot tech if you're a, a LaTeX user or a former LaTeX user. So this exists and it's very cool that this file exists because now um, if I rerun load all, I think I need to rerun load all for that. I type question mark, the name of my function and I get the documentation of my function here with so very important documentation for this um, simple function. So the workflow here was to write documentation here with Worksygen2 tags, then running document to transform that into information from the name, for the namespace and into an RD file. And this way we get uh, documentation. So at this stage, we have, um, a very small package. I'm going to install it once, so just so we see uh, that it uh, can be available. So there are several ways uh, to install a package. Uh, from here, I'm going to use the build tab in R Studio, and in this build tab, there is a command called install and restart. So I'm going to install the package and restart the R session. So. And that's not something one necessarily does a lot when developing packages because one can use load all instead, but it's still uh, useful to see uh, how things would look like for users. So it has installed the package, we started the R session and um, loaded the R package with library mini package. So now if I type what time it, uh, it works. So our package can be installed and the function is available when we, when we do that. And I haven't changed our studio uh, our session, but it means that I could uh, close our studio, come back, type library mini package, uh, write the name of the function, and the package is really there in, on my computer. So um, when developing an R, uh, sorry, I'm going to look whether there are questions until now. Whether questions? Uh, there aren't any additional ones, it seems like. I do have a question though. Yep. My my R Studio doesn't have that build tab. I suppose I have to add it there. Yeah, what does DevTools uh, as Devel? Uh, so I've just got console terminal and jobs. Yeah, but have you installed DevTools? Yes, yes. Have you restarted R Studio after doing that? That's probably. Okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe no, right? <laughs> I'm just trying to maybe that's I'm, sure, I'm sure someone else has also done the same thing. I'll try that now. <laughs> I hope it works because if, if it doesn't, well, we are. so so what it's what what there another possibility. Sorry, I will jump in. I, I, I because I struggle with this the same thing, and then it will only have the build thing if you have both installed DevTools and that your repo your project is a package because our. Mm -hmm projects could be a package or don't be a package. And then if you if you create a 
if you create a new project which you which is not a package you can just overwrite it with this dev tools uh create package or whatever at the same basically location it will add all the necessary like files so the r studio will understand that what you are in is the package and then you'll have the build thing sorry thank you <laughs> thank you uh did that help inger oh you're muted <laughs> sorry it did restart r and it's still not there so but, will... but you are not in our you are not in a package project yet right um so if you if you try create package in that new R Studio session, do you see the yes. build Yes, yeah. So I've created I've no I've created a package, mm -hmm. um, and it worked and and it's in my uh, R project environment here, but the build tab still doesn't. Do you use show. are you on, on on Windows? Yes. Yeah. So maybe that's a question of our tools then. Um, okay. Okay. I'll. Yeah, I'll, so, I'll yeah. Don't don't hold up for me. I'll no, figure but just out look, uh, I'll share. I'm just looking at the setup. Uh, yeah. Here, does it? Yeah. So it has a documentation on our tools. Okay. And it tells you where to go install it. Okay. And I think in that case, you if you run dev if you right now run dev tools dev rep, it should tell you that our tools is missing or something like that. Okay. I'll check. No. I'll share my success on the chat. Yeah, <laughs> thank. Um, okay, so uh, we have this small package, and when we build a package, it's important to follow the standards, um, especially if we want to submit the package, when, for instance, to to run. And a way to ensure that some standards as respected is a check function uh, of the DevTools package. It runs a thing called the R command check uh, command. So there will be other ways to run that, but DevTools check is just very um, handy. So it's check here. And it also has a lot of output. So it checks several things. For instance, um, that you don't have weird files lying around that it doesn't know about because you can only have certain files in our package. So, and it gives me one warning. So we could go and read everything that's checked, but let's just um, concentrate on what didn't uh, go well. It has a warning. It says that I have uh, invalid license file pointers. So in my description file here, it says license MIT plus file license, except I haven't added the file license, so it is complaining. So how am I going to solve that? I'm going to use and use this function. So use this function, use MIT license. And now I have two license files. I have two because one of them is for R to uh, appease R command check. The other one is a Markdown file. It's for readability because this one, for instance, will uh, be rec recognized by GitHub. So that's why we have two of them. And if I run the check again, while it's running, do you have progress to report Inger or you, you haven't been able to install our tools yet? <laughs> it's fine. I, <laughs> you haven't, I was watching you. Sorry. I oh, was yeah. not focusing <laughs> Sorry, on myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now it's clean. Like we have no error, no warning, no notes. Uh, it's very good. Our package is in a good state. And it's good to ensure our command check is passing right from the beginning when the package isn't too complex, because then later when you add stuff, you can see if you have a regression. So you don't want to, so it's easier to have this clean check because then if you break things, if you make things worse, it will be much easier to, to see that they're actually um, worse. So, um, so that's DevTools check. And I wanted to make my, my function a bit more complicated. Right now it has no parameter and I'm going to add one a parameter that can change is its behavior. So for that, I'm going to my snippets page again, and I'm going to uh, use uh, the copy paste button here. I come back to R2 and I'm going to replace the code here. Um, with the new code from my clipboard, and I'll explain what, what it is. So now my function has a parameter called language. I start by checking that it is in the value I accept, which are in this case, I accept 
FR, like French, and EN, like English. And, and so this part make, means that there will be an error uh, if the user enters another value. So this is a homemade parameter checking because I am not using another package to do that. There are other ways to check and, or assert that um, parameter uh, inputs are the right one, but we'll just use that um, now. So then like uh, before it formats the time in a certain format. And then depending on the language, I'm using the switch uh, function. I have to admit that if I didn't have the example already written, I wouldn't remember how the switch function work. Uh, I always have to look at the help for the switch function when I use it. Oops, sorry, I wanted to show the help page of the switch uh, function. So it, does it have example? Yeah. So in any case here, based on the language, if it's FR, it's going to do that, which is printing the time, uh, like uh, a sentence with the time in French. And if it's in like English, then it will uh, show this. So uh, let's see how it works. So I'm going to save the file. So I will with this button or I did control S. So I've saved the file. I'm going to reload the functions after I'm going to restart R just to be in a clear state. So I'm using the uh, load all function from the DevTools package. Okay, now say I type what time language is equal to ES, um, like Spanish, then it's, uh, it gives me an error because I need to choose FR or EN. So now I'm going to choose um, uh, FR. And it gives me this sentence uh, in, in French. So it, it works. The problem is when I load the documentation for my function, it has no documentation of the parameter. So I need to add, add that because uh, it's uh, clearly important. So for that, oops, I'm going to add a tag here, the param tag. And the param tag takes the name of the parameter and then its definition. So say, language, either fr or en. So, so this is not a very precise or good documentation, but it's just how to show how this could work. Um, so I have added the tag here. This page hasn't magically uh, uh, gotten updated. To update the manual page, I need to run the document function again. And then if I type question mark, oops, uh, what time? Now I get the uh, documentation of the parameter. Note that if I had forgotten to update the documentation and I had run the DevTools check function, this is definitely something that would have been picked up. So something that would have given an error, I think. So, uh, and let's run the DevTools check function just to make sure these things work. And it's also the occasion for me to see whether there are any, any question. Uh, Andre has got a, a question there about what is the recommendation about file names? You've got a That's dash it. and an underscore. Yeah, I, I can't remember why, but I think I see a, a dash more often, but I, couldn't tell you why. Like, like my first uh, idea would be to go see popular packages and see how their files are named. What is important is to have the same name for your, in general, for your R script and the test file, which we're going to, to see now. That's important then, but the underscore would be uh, fine. Can you name some other method of parameter checking? Yes, so I uh, I can even recommend a blog post that has been written by Hugo Grizzer and other uh, people on their R Hub blog. So um, if I go to resources here and here, I'm going to copy the link. So this is a whole post about input checking in uh, in packages. Um, and Pilar, how would we upload data? So yeah, so I will I will show later um, I, I the name of a function to uh, share data with a with a package. But we can come back to the uh, question. Um, okay, so how do I minimize? What have I done here? Sorry. Um, okay, so we have the, the function, but we haven't 
tested it. So we have tested it. Like, like what I've done, uh, I've shown you interactively. Oh, if I put yes, it doesn't work. If I put F FR, it does uh, expected behavior. Except over time, when I'm going to uh, expand my package, I, it would be a loss of time to do these interactive checks uh, and test myself all the time. So I'm going to add a unit test file that will ensure this small uh, code tests are run uh, more automatically. So for that, I'm going to use the use this use test function and I'm going to use the same name as my R script, so what time. And this did a, a lot of stuff because that's the first unit test we're adding to this package. So it added test that to suggest field in description. So um, to, uh, uh, because uh, it will, show that we need a test that package for the test. There are other packages for testing your package test that is the most popular one and the one we're going to use uh, today. I've never used any other one, so uh, I wouldn't be able to, to show them. And then it uh, said that we're using test that third edition. If you're learning to, uh, to use test that today, good news, you don't need to worry about that because you, would, you won't have known any other edition of test that. Whereas folks who have, who have packages uh, that have used TestVat for a longer time have needed to update their TestVat usage to the new edition. But if you're new to TestVat, you're learning the newest stuff directly and you don't need to worry. So then what uh, use test did was creating the test folder. And under the test folder, it has a test that folder and as well as test that file but we never need to, uh, this file here, we never need to, um, to edit it by hand. So we just ensure that R will know how to uh, run the test. So we go to test that, and we have this uh, file that has been created, test what time that R, and it has um, uh, a standard example in there. It says test that multiplication works, expect equal. So in that case, I don't want uh, multiplication to work, I just want what time to work um, and I'm going to add test. So I will test that uh, my function returns a character um, as a normal behavior. So I use expect type. Then I, I tap what time here and character. So this so test that is a new language in, in, in a way that you need to learn because it has this, uh, like any other package, it has its own syntax. And syntax is that you have the test in this test that um, wrapper, you know, with the curly braces. And in there, you can type code and you, all, and you type this expectation. So I expect type and then you have the code, what time and what you expect. I expect, and this means I expect the result of the what time function to be of type character. Um, so this uh, the result, and then I'm going to run the test to see if that's true. To run the test, there are several ways, and uh, uh, ultimately the most efficient way is to have some sort of keyboard shortcut to, to do that. But like today, for the sake of simplicity, we're going to click on the run test button that's here in the test um, uh, in the test file. And the result appear here, and it. Uh, not many package, it use that, and it says that all my tests, well, my, all my own <laughs> one test passed. Um, so that's one way. Once you have several test files, not only one, you could go to the build tab, for instance, and under more, you could test package, and this would mean running all the test files at once. So you can run one test at a time, all test files at a time, and DevTools check will also run all the tests. So this is all the way your tests uh, are going to, to be run. So this is uh, an expectation. I wanted to show the, um, wait, where are, is the documentation I wanted to show, sorry. So, and the demo. Uh, Test that, how is test that? So, no, sorry, so that was under snippet. So that's, shoop. 
no go. So I'm just going to type this from memory, uh, testpad.lib.org. Um, so this is the documentation for the testpad function uh, package. What I wanted to explain is how I knew that it was expect type. So that's something um, one can remember, but there, we, we can look at the reference and there, there are all the different expectations. So for instance, if you have a vector, you could use the expect length function to see whether the vector has a given uh, length. So, and there aren't that many uh, expectations to, so you could look at all of them. So that's uh, very recommended because otherwise you might be reinventing one that exists. And another thing that's good to know is if you find yourself writing a very similar test that snippets all over the place, like maybe you are checking for a given output that it's of a given type, of a given length, and of a given value, and you're doing that several times, you could write your own expect function. And for that, you would use the article custom expectation to just to have your own test, uh, test function. Okay, and then, so that's uh, one expectation. What I also wanted to show is how you would test for an error. And uh, one thing that's very um, uh, adapted for that as a snapshot test that I've been recently added to test that. So let me show you what I, uh, how it looks like. So it's expect snapshot error. And I'm going to type something that will give an error. So long wage equal not good. And so just this and a snapshot, well, it means that I'm going to run the test the first time and it's going to record the results. So let me show you by clicking on the run test button. Oops, maybe I should move that here. And it tells me it added a new snapshot. This snapshot leaves under the snaps folder. So under test, test pad, snaps, we have our Magdon file here called what time, and it recorded the result, the error that we uh, have gotten. So now say I am updating my package for, and I go to the what time function again, and here I decide to change, choose for say, uh, I'm going to add a typo here. For whatever reason, I'm going to add a typo. So one, oh, uh, Two, uh, so it should be two O and then O three. Okay, so I change the source code for my package. Now I go to the test again, and I'm going to run the test. And here it tells me failure. There is a failure, and the failure is that the snapshot of what time language equal not good has changed. So the old version. What I had was either choose FR or EN as a language, and now I have this. I can clearly see that it's a typo, especially because I added it one minute ago on purpose. But in any case, this kind of output that uh, test that gives you for snapshot test is very useful to, to see. So, and it tells me if it's what I intended to do, I can accept the change by running this, or I can use review. So review is good if the difference is very big or you have several different differences so i'm just going to show what review does here if i run snapshot review oops i forgot to to load all i think yeah so it's a shiny app and on this uh shiny app here we can we see the change uh, i need to put it and i can Either skip uh, this because I uh, I think it's uh, if I had several one to, to review I think that's a, a change that's bad or I can accept the new the new uh, version. So here I'm going to say to stop, fix my code, and I'm going to run the test again. So. Um, so to just to summarize, so in a, in a test file, you can have expectation like this one where you have your code, what you expect, or you could have the snapshot test where you record something that expect is the first time you run it, it will record what's happening because you, you know that it's a behavior that you want. And later it will always check what's uh, obtained to this snapshot, to this standard uh, result. And in that case, I use snapshot error but to come back to the documentation of uh, test that, 
you can have snapshot for any kind of code. So if you have code that say uh, outputs HTML or like something that's not that cool to write uh, as an expect like a normal expectation, you can use expect uh, snapshot. So that uh, and you have the one for error, but also for warning. So it's very it's very useful and nice to to work with. So it's for snapshot and let me run DevTools check again. Now that I have test for it to run. Are there any other questions? No, don't see any more questions. I have a question. I just was writing okay. it and then I realized I can just ask. <laughs> so what is your recommendation about the test? Because in this test file, you can put more tests, right? You can do, because you're, you have one test, which is called what time works. Mm -hmm. and then you can do, you know, what time error. And then mm -hmm. you put more individual tasks in it, right? You put or mm -hmm. expectation too. So when do you, would you break it into multiple? Mm -hmm. Because what do you... you because you can just do two, which will have just one mm -hmm. expectation each, yeah. or you can do one, which is a giant one. What would be the recommendation? Yeah, so that depends on, uh, yeah, for yeah, for instance, it, it would probably be better if we split this one in two. So let's say I'm going to past it and this one. So the first one will be for the working and maybe this. So you would have the first one that is it works well, and maybe you could add a test for when it's uh, uh, the two different languages and the other one would be for the error itself. So the idea is just that when it fails, so the, it's really to simplify your own life. When it fails, it will tell you this, fail. So uh, the name here should be something that helps you uh, pinpoint the problem more, more easily. And also when you're reading your test file, so here it's so short that it's not very really permanent. If it's very long, Maybe it may it probably easier for you if it's is split. So there is no <laughs> golden rule as that you should be able to read it and debug it. Like maybe like if you you see that the failure are hard to debug, that's time to uh, refactor the test uh, file. Uh, and there is a a really good blog post, and I I don't remember if it's in the resources. Is it in the resources? Uh, maybe not. So I. Uh, well, after the demo, there will be a break. Maybe I can put the link. There is a, a blog post that's called something like "Good Dev Why Good Developers Write Bad Tests," and it explains how you can make test files readable. It's it's quite good. So uh, DevTools check uh, seem to be happy uh, with the package. Now we're going to modify the function. Well, I did miss a question yeah. here. Pilar yeah. asked a question, um, maybe for later, but how would we upload data to the package? Oh yeah, so but I said I would, I would add show it um, later. Later, okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, so the snippets, where are the snippets again? Here. Why don't you? That's interesting, but I can't, uh, I don't seem to have control over my Firefox window. No, why is it so? So maybe I will update it by hand. So um, so I'm going to update the package just so that it will uh, use another package, a praise package. So to it's uh, often the case that your package will use other package to build upon them. Maybe you are going to use Deployer, for instance, for your data managing. In that case, you need to register the package so that if the user installs the package, they also installs this other package that's um, uh, used in the package. So for that, we're going to use use this use package praise. So and. Uh, it added the praise package to the description here under import. We now have the praise package and it says that no, in my package, if I use a praise function, uh, it's better if I namespace them. So we see where they come from. And also because uh, overall it's a bit more complex to, um, to have them available in our code. I, it's just that I want the package to have a message uh, in it, so I'm going to do praise, praise, um, and template. So I can't remember how the praise package work. So exclamation. Okay, that's what I want. Exclamation here. 
So I've added a message in my package that will um, uh, message a random exclamation from the praise package. So this is a new line. Let's uh, see how this works. So if I do load all, and now I type the name of my function, what time? It has haha before it gives a result, g and etc. So it uses a praise uh, package. So, and I'm going to run DevTools check again just to see it's not a problem. So in that case, it's a message. It's completely useless. But often you will need you you will use other packages for stuff that's actually pretty central and crucial for the package. Are there any questions? No. Okay. So. So uh, at this stage, what we have in our package is one function. It has one parameter. It uses one external package. We have test for this uh, function, but uh, there is no way anyone is going to find out about a package because it's only on my computer and it has documentation for a function, but no general documentation. So I'm going to fix that now. So first I'm going to add a readme to uh, my folder and a readme rmd so it means an r markdown readme that i'm going to knit and that will serve as a demonstration for my package uh, when you will knit the readme it's going to use the um, uh, installed version of my package i'm going to install it again just so it's uh, the most recent uh, recent version i had and so the readme that has been created as a uh, readme option. It has a, a placeholder for badges that use this might help us add, so it's important. And it has text uh, to fill. So the goal of mini package is to tell me or tell you what time it is. In this case, it's uh, this package is completely useless. But in general, when you're writing a package, taking the time to pitch your package is super important because. Uh, a, a user is going to skim the readme and it's important at this point to really explain what it is so that people that need the package see that it's actually the package they need and that people that should be using something else can see that it's not what they were after. And then it has the uh, installation instruction. I can't fill them in yet because my package isn't on GitHub yet, but later I can fill this in and say that it can be installed from GitHub. And you have the space here for an example. So I'm going to put the example, what time, language is equal to yen, and what time, language is equal to fr. And I'm going to delete the over template that I hear. And I'm going to knit my readme. Um, OK, so now there is a readme. Uh, MD exist here, so it's a result and the example has been run, so it show what the package does when you run the, the function. Um, okay, so it now the package has a document uh, a documentation for users, but it's still only on my computer, so I'm going to put it on GitHub with the use this use GitHub function. So it's going to work, just to note that it's going to work sort of magically for me because of the setup I've done before. But so uh, if you look at the, the documentation of the use this package, so there is a setup article, very important to do. But for Git and GitHub in particular, there is a managing GitHub credentials article. So this is super important to, um, to be able to uh, use GitHub uh, um, sm smoothly from your R session. And if you use, uh, Ubuntu, like me, these things might be more complex, but I've put a link somewhere to a blog post by Daniel Navarro. Is it here? Mm. Where is that? I'm pretty sure I put it somewhere, but where? Maybe not then. OK, so uh, somewhere there is a post by Daniel Navarro about Git and GitHub credentials with use this uh, Ubuntu uh, level or Ubuntu edition because then things might be a bit more a bit trickier. 
but I'm, I use Ubuntu and I was able to get to uh, work. So it's not uh, hopeless, especially with this uh, blog post. So I'm going to type use GitHub. And I, there are several uh, arguments, for instance, private. So I don't want this to be private. This is going to be public, but it's good to know that you can create a private repository from your GitHub session. So um, there are, oh, I forgot to use Git the whole time. So <laughs> I'm just going to do a very informative comment. So sorry, very informative comment message. So in general, you wouldn't want to do that. But um, okay, so I'm just going to stop share just for a second. Oops, just so I do. Um, wait. Okay, back uh, and yes, I'm going to proceed. I just did a comment <laughs> and I just stopped sharing when I was typing the password. Is it okay to commit it? Uh, yes, because what it did is it added, the, it's very cool that when you use just this to create the GitHub repository, it stores the URL to your GitHub repository in your description file. So, but which is super useful for various things, like in particular users. Okay, so now it's creating the GitHub repository uh, with the very informative COVID message and all the content is in there. Uh, it used the description title that I had typed example stuff as a description for the repository. And there is a readme. So anyone who comes to my repository can see what it does. They don't need to install the package because there is a demo here. So they see uh, what it's about. And I just needed to have the use uh, get uh, to do the use GitHub function. Of course, after a bit of setup, uh, setup that is boring, but that is only that only happens once per computer. Uh, okay, and I cannot update the way people can install the package. So now someone could install this package by using say the remote package here and they would the remote install github uh, mail and uh, mini package so that would be one way to and i'm going to need to readme to update it so that would be one way to install my package maybe later i would submit it to cran and then people could install the package with install the packages. Maybe I could create my R universe uh, universe, and they would install it from there. Uh, let me show you a new universe. So that's something you uh, would set up from here. There is some documentation of how to set it up. No, that's not the documentation. I can show you later in the, on the OpenSci blog, there is um, a short, note on how you would create your iUniverse. So you could have a page like this, and there would be a way for people to install your package from the iUniverse, which means it might be faster because it's a, and they wouldn't need uh, the remote package. So they could install for instance, uh, bin binary. So to come back on track on what I had written here. So we have the GitHub repository. Now people could install the package from the GitHub repository. So update installation instructions here. Okay, and another thing, cool thing that people could do from our uh, repository, where is it now? Oh, I have closed it, but there is a use this function called browse GitHub. So from my R session, when I am in this package, if I type rose GitHub, it opens their GitHub repository of this package I was working on. So now someone could go here and open a bug or a report or feature request from the issues tab because now it's open. Um, and uh, one of the last things I wanted to, to show is uh, the use of what's called continuous integration. So during the demo, I've typed DevTools check quite often. 
and I had to remember to do that, it's uh, better to not have to remember. And we can actually ask GitHub to run DevTools check for us. So how would, would, would we do that? We're going to use and use this function again. So called use GitHub action check standard where is it? this one. So it's going to add uh, a YAML file to our repository. And then I'm going to send this uh, to commit this to GitHub. And these are instructions for GitHub actions, which is GitHub's continuous integration service to run to like how to install R and then how to run the uh, check of my package. So, and another thing is indeed, so it now what's the difference in my package is that I have, oops, I have a .github folder that has a workflows uh, folder and it, in, in it there is a YAML file. And this YAML file uh, is taken from a, a template on GitHub and it's going to run our command check on my package. Um, and what it also updated is the readme. So I'm going to need it again because it, it added a badge to my readme. So the badge is here uh, and this badge will be useful. We'll see this in a, in a second. So I'm going to put this on, on GitHub because this is where this file will be useful. So add GitHub actions workflow. And so just uh, as a reminder, the only function I get to run to do this is use GitHub action check standard. Now I'm going to uh, GitHub here. If I update the page, so I have a badge now in the readme, our command check, no status because it's only just starting to run. Um, so it has no status yet, but the goal is to have a green badge here. And now I can, uh, I see here a yellow dot. I could click on it, but I'm going to access uh, what's happening via this tab, actions. So actions is a continuous integration service from for GitHub. And what is it going? It's uh, running my workflow here as a, a comment check. I can click here and see all these things happening. So what's happening here is that R and my package are being installed on all these uh, different virtual machines on Mac, Windows, Ubuntu, different R versions, the release version, the develop version, the older uh, release version. And it's going to run all the tests. And this is going to happen every time I make a change to my package, every time I make a commit, there will be here, the check I'm going to be run. If everything goes well, there will be no error. My badge will be green. If something goes wrong, the badge will be red, but more importantly, I'm going to get a notification. I will know I have broken my package. If I had noticed this locally, it is, it is quite a cool safe word to have. Um, so that's uh, one thing I wanted to, to show. Are there any questions? No? No questions. Okay, so that's... Uh, one thing, so now we don't have to run DevTools check locally, or we could, <laughs> we should, but now we, if we forget, it's going to be done on GitHub. Another aspect I wanted to explain is that uh, now currently, if someone is curious about my package documentation that get is already here, but imagine you were not a package developer, so one learning the, to develop a package, the GitHub interface might be a bit busy, a bit disconcerting because it has a lot of things that have nothing to do with your package itself. So it's cool to have an actual document. Luckily these days, thanks to the package on package, it's quite um, uh, easy to do. So the first thing we should do is install the package on package. Then we can create a website for the, for the package. So first let's run the use package done function by use, it's a use this function. What it did here, it created a package done uh, configuration here. Later, we should add the URL to our website here and it uses the latest template for package done. Now I'm going to run package done build site. So what it does, it takes all the documentation of my package and it makes it into a beautiful HTML website. So 
so it's a bit long and it opens a preview. So now I have a website for my package. So it's uh, nicer, it has a reference, so we can click on the um, documentation of what time it has run the example. So it's all very good. But currently, the only place where that uh, website exists is my doc folder here. I could put it maybe on an FTP server somewhere, but if that's not very handy, I am going to have GitHub Actions build the website for me so that I don't need to, um, to worry about it ever. So for that, I'm using a use this function, use um, oops, GitHub Action and package done. It will work because this, this workflow called package done is in the standard set of uh, workflows of things that you can do. So it has added in the .github folder, in the workflow folder, I know I have uh, another YAML file called package done. So I'm going to commit all of this to GitHub. So. Yeah, um, so if I go to my GitHub repository here, so now it's building the package done website and I will then make it available online, but it's uh, still running. I just wanted to ask you whether there were any questions now. I don't see any in the chat. And also, Ah, oh, there is a question here. Yeah. What procedures do we have to follow to package, a, publish a packaging cram? Oh, that's <laughs> that's the last item <laughs> on my <laughs> demo. This is so neat. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So, <laughs> so first of all, you need to have no uh, error, no warning, no note on your uh, argument check result. But there are a lot of things to remember, uh, which is uh, um, hard, but there is a way to um, to remember what you need to do. So there is a function in use this called use release issue. So let me run it. No, sorry, I'm not in the right, I'm not in my package. So of course it's not going to right to work here, use release issue. Uh, so this will be a say a major release of my package. It opened what it did is that it opened an issue in my package repository for everything I need to do. So <laughs> it might look overwhelming, but it's very cool because I won't forget anything. So this is a list that has been created by the Tidyverse team at R Studio. So they maintain a lot of packages. So they have really a good experience, a good overview of what is important for CRAN. So they tell you everything that you need to do. You need to check, for instance, that all exported functions have a return and an examples tag. The link to the extra checks that Davis Brown has listed on the, in a GitHub repository. So that's a lot of things, but if you follow all these steps, and if you get help for the one that might be tricky, I would explain how you, where you can get help, you know, from other, other humans, then uh, things um, should go okay. So that's how you would uh, do that, get your package on CRAN. Let's go back, let's go back to the actions. Is this still building? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I still wanted to show how you would really publish the package where, sorry, where is it in the process? Is it worth waiting? Um, maybe not. So um, I, I'm going to show the uh, slides that follow the demo, then we can have a five minutes break and we can come back to the package on, uh, afterwards where are the break, the slides. So in this demonstration, I've shown a lot of things, but uh, there, I think what's important to remember is that you use DevTools at all to load your functions. So you edit the code, you load them, you can trust them interactively. So that's a way you don't source our scripts. Then uh, you might have noticed, or I hope you have noticed that for everything that you add to a package, you can use, use this package. So to have your check the package check on GitHub, uh, every time you make a change, I use this function to ensure that. If you want to add a new R script, you use use this for that. So it's very handy to not have to remember the small uh, details uh, that go into things. 
DevTool check was important um, and to run it regularly so that you ensure you follow the standard that you don't, you're not breaking your package or, over time. Note that DevTool check will run your test of the function. So what is really, so uh, I, I would make the case that all this infrastructure stuff is not really hard. It's just something that one needs to learn, which is <laughs> in a way hard, but it's it's really routine after a while. What's really hard is writing good code, writing a good interface, writing good docs, all these things that, um, that are less uh, routine. And uh, uh, in the slides after the break, I will uh, give uh, resources of where one can find help and resources to um, develop one's skills in writing these uh, things. So you can do more with packages when writing a function that gives you the time. <laughs> so you can share a, an R Markdown template. Thanks to use this function, use R Markdown template. It's super cool if you, all your R Markdown files start with the same chunk, for instance, you're loading the same package every time. Then you can share maybe an R Markdown template. You can distribute data using the use, this, use data package a function. And as use this use data uh, function as good documentation, and it explains you how you can have data for your package itself. So data that your function use, they or also data that your users can load. Like there's quite a lot of, of packages in the R ecosystem that uh, share data. And also to answer Pilar question, there is a, a blog post on the Harvard blog about sharing data with your R package, a different uh, scenario. You can package a Shiny app if you use the Gollumverse framework in particular. And you could also, uh, like some people argue that you could uh, like uh, make your analysis a package um, if you um, uh, use the concept of a research compendium. Now uh, you can do less packages. So uh, if you want to make a package for a, a wider distribution, Maybe check that no one has written the same package yet. Even, and of course, even if there is another package that does the same thing, it doesn't mean you shouldn't write one. Maybe your, your package will be different, maybe better, but still it's worth checking that if the effort has been made by someone else and maybe you just need to install that package instead of writing it yourself. Regarding the idea of packaging your projects, your analysis, Mouse McBain has written a post that explains uh, that uh, he thinks it's not um, such a, a good idea. So that's something to uh, think about. If you have questions, you can write them in the doc or in the chat. And I suggest we have a small break before the next uh, part. Yeah, see. Uh, Andre has got his hand up. Sorry? Andre? Ah, uh, yeah, so, okay. sorry. No, oh. I didn't want to jump into the time break, but okay, but my after the break. Was, uh, yeah, yeah, after, yeah, after, after the break. break. Yeah. <laughs> was... So we're back. <laughs> um, I'm just going to go back to the uh, GitHub repository to see where the package done. Yeah. So just as a reminder, in the repository. Uh, we have added a uh, rock flow here, uh, the package on the YAML file, that ensures that every time we make a change, we commit it to GitHub, the package on the website is built. And it's not built because we see here, uh, if we see actions package done, it has worked, but the website isn't available anywhere. So I just wanted to show how you make it available. So you go into settings, and then there is uh, a tab called pages, GitHub pages. So the website will be served by GitHub. So, uh, and we will indicate that the source is a GitHub pages branch because that's where the workflow that we've added uh, puts the website source. So I'm going to save here. And now it's good, uh, um, the GitHub pages website is going to be built. Uh, if we go to the page here, no. No, it's still not there. Let me, uh, I should be able to see it from here, but I'm not, okay. And now uh, if I type, sorry, I'm going to click here just to have the URL here. So it's not built yet, but it's going to be uh, to be built because overall, all those are, the, um, 
the source of the website exists. It's not uh, served by GitHub yet. Uh, to check that, I think, yeah. Okay, here, uh, now in the actions folder, we have the Ackerman check, but we, the actions tab, sorry. We have the Ackerman check workflow, the packaging workflow and the page build deployment workflow. It's something that GitHub has to indicate whether the uh, GitHub pages website is up or not. And I think now it means that if I type mail.github.io mini package, yes. So my website now exists. So I add to do two things add the GitHub Actions workflow to my repository and tweak the settings of my repository. And then I have this beautiful website here. And for people to find it, I am going to put the link to it here on the, in, the GitHub, um, in the GitHub repository. And I will also, I should also put it in the description file, but just uh, that was, uh, I just wanted to show this uh, quickly, the, these uh, tweaks. Uh, then there was a question before I go to the next slides by Andre. Sorry, thank you. So I was just wondering about, uh, I, um, I tried to, you know, did do this with the package, like release it on CRAN, but then I found, as you said, that any warning or notes will prevent from doing this right but even if the notes is something like if you use uh tidyverse or you use mutate or deeply and if there is any variable which is not declared for example in the code that mm. it will make a note that it's not a thing mm. which we can find and that note's preventing it from releasing from cran so is there any way so yeah, so, to do yeah. That? so in general Sometimes notes can be prevented, so that's a pity, but in that case, you would write about them in the CRAN comments file. Now, for this case in particular, the tidyverse case, um, you should go to the deployer doc page, deployer.tidyverse.org. So because this note, um, it's quite common, but if you go to the article programming with deployer, they've really uh, they've written uh, how tos and it tells you how you should write your code, so get the outcome and check notes. And often it's a matter of using this thing here, the dot data adverb. So if that's your uh, notes, that's, uh, the good news is that there is a rather straightforward way to remove it, and then you're fine with crime because your life as a CRAN submitters will be much easier if you remove all notes, if you have no notes. So that, uh, and there is a similar article with for ggplot2, programming with ggplot2. Uh, okay, so now I'm... So hopefully I can open the rest of the... No, <laughs> I can't. So I'm going to go to um, here and I'm going to show you the website locally. Sorry, I, I think it just... <laughs> I fire a frog session, but I'm not sure, but... Okay, so okay, so we've seen how to create a ba basic package, but I, I wanted to explain how you um, do the rest of the way uh, to submit your package to CRAN or to just to become a, a better R package developer over time. So there are workflow automation tools, some things we don't need to um, to run. So to assess your package to know uh, whether it falls the standard, you can use our command check, which we have done a lot via the DevTools check function. If you want to submit your package to Bioconductor, there is a, a package to, uh, to implement the check for Bioconductor, BioCheck. Uh, uh, my colleague, Mark Padgam, has been developing the package check package that returns a whole report of a lot of things that your package um, should do better. If that's not the case yet, it's much more uh, comprehensive that our command check. It does run our command check, but also over check. Similarly, you have the good practice package and the Lintar package. For the Lintar package, mostly concentrates on code style issue. So after you've done a certain amount of work on a package, running these packages will give you di diagnostics that can be uh, extremely uh, useful. Then what you are, once you have unit test, it's a, the unit test cover most of the behavior of your package and it can be measured. Like it's not perfect to use that as a diagnostic, but it's useful to know how many lines of your code are run by test. So for doing that, you can use directly the cover package for uh, coverage function. 
And also useful, there is a spell check function in the DevTools package. So these are good to know about. And the last note on the package check package, you can now run it on GitHub Actions very easily. So if you look at the documentation of package check there, you can uh, quite easily add it as a GitHub Actions workflow so that every time you make a change to your package, this uh, comprehensive report is run on your package. So now these are diagnostic tools. So once you have this uh, report and it tells you that something is wrong, how do you improve the things? Do you do that by hand? So some of the things can be done automatically. If the issue is called styling, uh, to a certain extent, it can be uh, done automatically with Styler. I mean to a certain extent because Styler isn't going to give more informative name to your variable. That's not something that can be done automatically. If you use Styler, it's best to pair it with version control, just you can keep tr uh, uh, track of the changes. Then we have used Roxygen 2 to um, uh, generate the namespace in the demo. And if you have an old package or you need to rescue an old package and maintain it after someone has given it to you and it didn't use Roxygen uh, 2, it, uh, if it's a package where, for instance, the RD files were written by hand, you can convert it to using our oxygen 2 by using the, a package called RD to Roxygen. Then I've shown that you can have a pretty documentation website for little effort by using package done. And what's also automatically the way is if you want to add a new test file, you can create a test file with use this. This is not going to write a test for you, uh, sadly. So when and where do you use these automatic tools? So that's a question because it's good to know about them, but they are useful and if you use them. So the uh, easiest way to use them is to have them run in continuous integration, which we have done with GitHub Actions, where we run uh, everything uh, every time a change was made. Uh, Julia Silgi wrote an article about continuous integration, about tra Travis continuous integration which is a service uh, that's no longer uh, recommended in particular by our own site, but the blog post is still very useful because of its definition here. So she wrote, the idea behind continuous integration is that CI, continuous integration, will automatically run our command check along with your tests, et cetera, every time you push a commit to GitHub. You don't have to remember to do this. CI automatically checks the code after every commit. So this is very powerful. And there are various GitHub actions and other services as well. So how do you learn continuous integration? So you can use the use this helper, in which case you don't need to learn um, uh, many things, just the comment and just the fact that they exist somewhere. And Jim Esther had given a talk about GitHub actions that may be useful. And another quote of you guys give that I like, which is about tra Travis, but that uh, transfers well to other continuous integration um, services is life hack. My go-to strategy for getting Travis builds to work is snooping on other people's .travis.yaml files. Shout out today to the idea of .travis.yaml for solving my problem. So if you have something, if you have something a bit weird uh, in your package, like say you need to install a system dependency that's a bit tricky, maybe you can go look at the configuration files for continuous integration of other packages and they will, it, it will help. That's super useful. Um, with continuous integration, instead of coupling something to every commit, you could also have stuff run on schedule. Maybe you could run our command check on your package every Monday or every time a label is applied to a progress. So especially if we get an action, so the possibilities are sort of endless. You can really tweak your workflow how you want to. Another tool I wanted to mention is pre-commit. So how do you write a good package? You could remember to do things well every time. You only write code that never breaks. Or you could use continuous integration to notice wrong stuff. Or you could use pre-commit hooks to not even commit wrong stuff. So these are checks that will be run every time you try to make a commit. And if the code doesn't pass the test, maybe it won't let you commit it. And in R, if you're interested in this concept, you can check out the pre-commit R package that uh, helps you set up these kind of hooks and that has hooks for R code. So it has hooks that will ensure you only commit passable R code or that your code is well styled. So that's, uh, that can be handy. And you can still, uh, there's still a way like to 
skip, skip the checks if you want to do a quick commit. Uh, I've mentioned that you can use a submission checklist when you release things to CRAN, because a, a release to CRAN in particular can be a good moment at which to uh, make sure everything is, is all right on your package. And the use this use release uh, issue is really here uh, um, life saving with all the items and all the tools that it recommends that you don't uh, forget. Now, uh, of course, you could spend a lot of time improving your workflow, adding continuous integration workflows, adding different stuff, and it might sound like procrastination because it maybe if you spend too much time doing that, you're not improving the package itself, it's meta work, but as a beginner, it's easier to create good habits. So adopt continuous integration right away <laughs> um, instead of waiting uh, a bit. Now, I, re I really want to uh, underline that it's important to read code and read about code or, and to improve your um, skills in, in, that, um, in this. So reading source code uh, can help you uh, when you want to know what is going on, like you're using a function and you wonder how it works, or if you want to build on a function or a package for your own goals. So it's good to see how it works. You're just curious or, uh, another use case is you want to use, say, the Arlong package, but you don't know how people use a given function and the documentation isn't enough for you. Maybe you can go and look for examples of Arlong usage in the world and that might help you. So how to read source code? So you can use a lookup package to read the definition of a function. You can use GitHub search and there are mirrors of all CRAN packages and of our source on GitHub. That's very, um, that's very useful to know about. So let's uh, just quickly. So yeah, so this is a organization with all the readerly mirror of all CRAN R packages. So we are, let's say we are going to look at the ggplot2 CRAN repository. In this repository, every commit is a version. So which means uh, this, Repository is useful to read the code, but uh, it might be easier to go read the actual repository of ggplot2. But what's really cool is that each of these commit is a version. So you can click on a, on a commit. And the diff, the diff here is what changed between two versions. So that uh, sometimes it's uh, handy to, to do that. So reading code is good, but it's also important to try things out. And I, I really liked uh, this podcast episode called Learning a New Code Base with Patricia Haas because he, she explained a series of steps you can do when you, um, when you get a code base. So say you're new at a job and you have to maintain a, an R package that someone else wrote. And that's quite overwhelming, especially if it's big and it's something you don't know. So you can, so what do you do? And she says the first step is you clone it, uh, you clone this uh, code base and you, install it to get it to build. And that's quite simple as a tip, but I, I found it very, uh, very cool because yes, of course, if you build it, then you've done something. You're not just here stressing about uh, how you're not going to understand it. You're doing something uh, practical. And she has other steps that she describes and I really recommend this um, episode. Then uh, I'm a blogger. So of course I wouldn't make the case for reading blogs. <laughs> But um, so reading blogs, blog posts about some topics might be a way to get digestion information. So for on our package development, so one of the best sources is the R packages book by Hadley Wickham and Jenny Bryan. But then for some topics that might be more niche, it can be useful to go read um, blog posts. So the sources might be the R Hub blog. On our open site blog and Technos, there are also quite a few topics on R package development. Um, the Tidyverse blog also features general advice on our package development. So for instance, on how to use test that. And in general, because any blog could uh, one day have a post on our package development, it's a good idea to subscribe to our weekly. And maybe you could blog about something that you figured out when uh, developing a package. For like uh, help forms can also be uh, useful. So to ask questions about our package development, you could use the R Studio community forum in the package development category, the R open site forum, or if you prefer emails, you could use the R package development mailing list. And if you subscribe, so you could subscribe to these forums, which is useful to learn new stuff, and also to see when people answer 
what what the what steps they take like seeing that people in general will be uh, using uh, reproducible examples maybe creating little toy packages to learn these things to get um, exposed to this uh, way of doing things uh, can be useful i would recommend sort of managing your subscription wisely so maybe you could have emails notifying about new topics coming into a special folder of your inbox so you don't get their emails uh, all the time at our urban side we have a system for software peer review which uh, is a transparent, constructive, non adversarial, and open review process for packages that are in our scope, um, which is uh, in general uh, packages for the research lab cycle. Uh, this system has been expanded recently into statistical software peer review. So that might be something that might be interesting for you to check out if you um, are developing a package or if you want to volunteer as a reviewer. And there are other venues for reviewing packages and submitting packages, such as the R journals, other journal, and others. Yeah, um, we don't have much time before the other slide deck, but I welcome questions <laughs> at this point. Thank you, Mael. Absolutely yeah, just, amazing. <laughs> we, we don't have new questions. No, I haven't seen any new questions, Catherine. Okay, Check so I could direct you the last <laughs> slide deck. Sorry, that's. Uh, very fast. So, no, how was I? Okay, here. Yeah, so, just in case you uh, want to live, um, participate in open source development, so maybe it's completely fine if you're developing an R package just for your uh, company, like uh, something uh, private, but maybe you want to participate more generally in package development. And I just wanted to uh, share a few thoughts on that. So why would you contribute to open source? Maybe you enjoy it. Maybe you want to give back because you're getting a lot and you have time and resources to give back. Maybe to, you want to develop your skills or get some sort of uh, exposure. So this might all be your reasons. Uh, I want to note that here I'm uh, mentioning writing, um, participating to app packet development, but you could give back to open source in other ways like organizing your LEDs chapter is a quite good way to uh, participate to open source. Um, so this slide is focusing on our package development. So it's important if you do that to find your happy place, especially if you're doing that in your free time, like for free, then uh, it's important to find the right uh, amount of time and the right task fit for you to be happy when you, when you do so and for this to be a sustainable um, thing. So maybe you could have your own package package or packages that you publish and that other people can use. This is great, especially having your own package, because uh, when it sees your package, you get the glory, you get to define the rules, and it's your name that's on it. But you could get uh, burnt out, especially if your package gets very popular. So it's cool if it's very popular, but then it means that you get a lot of uh, demands and a lot of bug reports from users. So you could be like this statue that gets attacked by babies, but where this, the things that attack you are your package, when one package is failing on CRAN because of a dependency changing something. Another package gets a lot of bug reports and this kind of uh, stuff. So an uh, interactions with user and contributors can be rewarding. It's quite cool to work together towards a, a goal, but can be time consuming. And sometimes there are people that are not kind, which is really not cool. As a maintainer, if you want package to your package to get contributors, it's important to make your repository a friendly place. So having a contributing guide, so like explaining what your expectations are, having a code of conduct, and maybe having a governance file. So having a governance file is something rarer, and it's really more for bigger projects, saying how the decisions are, are taken. There was an urban site community call about setting up your package to foster a community where these ideas were expanded a lot more. So another thing that you might do to contribute to open source is contributing to others packages. It can be a, a good way to start because it's uh, you don't have to invent the whole package yourself. It can be a way to, for you to concentrate on your strengths. If you hate writing documentations, maybe you can find a package where you contribute code only and other people are happy to write documentation. Or maybe you never want to maintain a package because of the time uh, it would take and you want to, uh, to rather to be a contributor or co-author. 
So how would you go about that? So except if it's a package at work and you're put on a team that has to develop the package, maybe you need to strategically uh, get into this uh, repository. So I would recommend first watching development and interaction. So on GitHub to uh, watching maybe all new issues, for instance. So, so to get a feel for the repository, to get an idea of how the maintainer wants things to happen. And also uh, I would recommend reading the contributing guide if there is one. But watching development really gives a good idea of how things actually happen, of the tone. Maybe you would uh, read a few issues and realize, I don't want to participate in this. It doesn't look uh, kind at all. And then you can start interacting in the repo, uh, maybe opening an issue, then a pull request, this kind of things. So how would you choose one package to contribute? So it could be a package that you use, especially if it's a way for you to get a feature in it that you need. You might want the package to choose a package based on what you can do or what you want to learn how to do. You should choose a package that has room for external contributions. Maybe because there are maybe packages that because they are professionally developed by people that are super active, they don't have that much time or room for external contributors that much need for external external contributors. And you definitely want to choose a package where your work is valued. It's better to make pull requests in a package where they will be at one point reviewed, where they will be, uh, and where you will get a thank you at some point. So uh, at our urban side, we try to be thankful to contributors. So every year there is a blog post thanking the contribution to the community and in particular contribution to our packages. Um, here is an example of a tweet that Hadley Wickham has sent a few years ago to thank a person, Christophe Dervieux, that had been a great help filling issues through um, the Tidyverse and Alib organization and making pull requests. So these are two examples. Uh, one does not necessarily need a tweet to uh, thank someone, but you want this uh, feeling, the feeling that someone uh, thanks you and uh, notices your uh, efforts. The problem with contributing to other packages is that your name won't be on it, especially if you are the member of a minority in the world of our package development, so say an R lady, then uh, you don't own the package and your name won't be like in the address of the GitHub repository. Hopefully you could be a co-author, so your name is still listed in the package on website. But um, may you have to think maybe of a way to still display your skills. So, giving talks, blogging, so just to ensure that you are visible if you need to as a uh, package uh, developer. So it was a very brief presentation and a complex topic. So we are over resources uh, about the topics. The book Working in Public by Nadia Ekbal, the OpenSec Contributing Guide by Stephanie Butlin and Steffi Lazarty, and OpenSec Collaborating Guide that we have um, in our dev guide for software peer review. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> thank you for uh, all for listening. Thank you to Ali Johannesburg, so the Bash and Inger for organizing and happy our package of them. And we have five minutes for questions. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think you need to thank us. I think we just we just ask, and then if you say yes, then we're like yes. <laughs> so really, really appreciate it. Um, uh, Pilo asks there will those slides remain on at the link? Yeah. Yeah, okay. There we go. Any other resources, Pilar? Sorry. I think oh, yeah, but... I'm not sure what else you I, asked I, you I, about. I, or, and I need to look in the Google Doc if I've answered the question. Yeah, so this one has been answered. Uh, I think, okay, but, uh, yeah. I think we did all of them. Do you agree? Mm -mm. Yeah, I'm just going to put a link to the blog post I've mentioned okay. uh, about the data uh, data in our packages. So oh, that'll be nice. So, yeah. for Pilar, so data. So okay. Any so other... I put the link now. <laughs> oh, okay. So now that that your earlier question, Pilar, is also hundred percent answered. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't see any more questions. We really, really appreciate your time. And um, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> and hopefully uh, a whole bunch of us will build our packages and then let you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with, please let without me know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. 
Okay, everybody, I'm going to stop the recording. I hope you have a lovely, lovely evening. And we'll see you soon. Keep uh, keep an eye on our on our uh, advertising our next event. Thomas, I will put the recording onto uh, the meetup. We'll be able to get it there.